Thailand, home of the oldest tropical evergreen forest in the world, where exotic wildlife roam nearly 200,000 acres of uninhabited jungle. Here in Thailand, there's almost 300 species of mammals and over 400 species of reptiles or amphibians. There's almost a thousand species of birds alone. So everybody and anybody that's into ecotourism or just wants to escape their cubicle comes here. Thailand's biodiversity attracts thousands of tourists each year. But the beauty they come to see masks incredible danger. You have venomous reptiles, stinging insects, mammal species, some of which are aggressive. You've got Asian elephants here. Poisonous centipedes, scorpions. There's just critters, critters everywhere. Trekking amongst the untamed wildlife here can quickly turn a dream trip into a living nightmare. If you get bit by a spider, you're going down that road of fear and panic. And when that adrenaline cocktail starts circulating through your body, it literally turns off the cognitive skills that we have to deal and process problems. You get lost, disoriented in an area like this, and that right there can get you killed. Survival experts Cody Lundeen and Dave Canterbury are deep in the Thai jungle to show how to survive one of the wildest, most rugged places on Earth. It's an amazing King Kong-esque landscape, but it does kill people. There's a lot of critters in the trees. There's a lot of critters flying through the air. This jungle will take a bite out of you. Freaking birds and monkeys out there, man. They're everywhere. In an environment like this, you get stung by something or bit by something, you need to keep your head. The more you freak out, the faster you die. Look at the size of that centipede. The place is swarming with wildlife. They call it wilderness for a reason, because it's wild. Beautiful jungle, though, huh? Dave Canterbury is an ex-army sniper who served a short time in the rainforests of Central America more than 11,000 miles from this Thai jungle. I do have jungle experience on one of my favorite terrains besides swamps. But you can't say that jungle is jungle, desert is desert. There's no such thing. They're all different in their own way. Oh, just freeze where you are, Dave. Oh, Wow, look at the size of that thing. Cody Lundin isn't at home here either. He lives off the grid in the Arizona desert and walks barefoot. Oh, limestone is just like razors, man. Yeah, they're rough. There's no jungle in Arizona. That's a challenge, because it ultimately means I don't know what in the hell I'm doing. I can rely on the experience I have, but we don't know if that thing stings or bites or pokes or pukes on you or whatever the hell it does. Oh, f You all right? <sighs> yeah, amazingly. We have zero experience in the Thai jungle for Dave, zero experience in the Thai jungle for me, and if you put on those truth glasses, you can see we're pretty clueless as far as this jungle goes. Yeah, we're not in Kansas, that's for sure. See a backpack, man. To live out this scenario, Cody and Dave only have the gear an ill-equipped ecotourist might carry on a day hike. Oof, look at that. That's sharp. Oh, yeah, like a razor. Big freaking Thai jungle knife. Good for working with bamboo with that curved blade because it wraps around the bamboo. It looks like he's got some steel wool in here to keep the rust off of it. Sharpening stone in here, too. <laughs> this bug's gonna be annoying as I can see on already. Guy was smoking. What's he smoking? Tobacco. Oh. And no fun in the jungle for us. Looks like a cell phone. What do you think about that? Oh, then, then everything's okay. Sure. We we'll can rescue just call. Right? One, it looks like it's broken, and two, we're in dense jungle canopy in the middle of God knows where. So, utter dependence on technology? Check. Broken cell phone? Check. So no water containers, no way to store any fluid? Nope. Anytime you're in the tropics where it's hot and humid, dehydration is a major, major factor. You're looking for a real hurt situation with heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Well, what do you think, man? <laughs> um, I think I'm looking at about a 600-foot limestone cliff ahead of me. Water's going to be downhill, obviously. Mm -hmm. Hydration's going to be key. So let's go down. Gravity seems to still work in Thailand. So we're going to descend and try to find water. 
If we find water, we may be able to drink it. If we have a way to disinfect it, if we can find a large body of water, we may be able to navigate it, then we can affect rescue. So in this scenario, our complete concern is focused on water. What worries me about dense jungle is that it limits our visibility. We can't really see where we're going. We're like being swallowed with vegetation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is what you gotta be careful of right here. You're constantly putting your hands on stuff out here in the jungle. This caterpillar, all these hairs are spikes. They all sting. And that's the way they protect themselves in the wild from predation. You get this stuff in your skin, and it's gonna be very, very painful. You'd be paying for it for days. Golly. Thick, thick, buddy, thick. Dense jungle is not only tough to get through, it's also home to some of the world's most dangerous predators. Cold-blooded animals like the king cobra and the giant Asian forest scorpion gravitate to shade, where cooler temperatures allow them to thermoregulate. Cody's barefoot, Cody's in shorts. You know, you have to pay attention to every step you take and every handhold you put your hands into because of the insects, the snakes, the spiders, all of those things just wait for you to put your hand or your foot in the wrong place. Got the sticker bushes right here, man. Careful of that. This jungle is pretty rough. I mean, look at that thing. This little species of doom, whatever the hell this thing is, looks like, you know, some demonic horn. So picture this, it breaks away in your flesh, causes potentially a septic reaction and infection, and you can go down. I mean, I can't literally, I can't break this. That's how tough it is. That's how tough this place is. Hear that man? That wind or I think water? That's water. It's coming down from the lowest part of wherever this place is here. Oh hell, dude, I can see it from here. It is water. Look. In a jungle scenario where the humidity's high and you're sweating profusely, water is a key element. It's freaking hot out here, man. Sweat city, man. Bad news. When the humidity is over 70%, sweat won't evaporate. As a result, the body can't cool itself properly. Freaking water. This water, typically I wouldn't drink it. It hasn't been disinfected. But we can put that over the head, neck area, or the core, the torso area, to keep ourselves cooler. Oh, it's nice and cool too, Cody. Water conducts heat away from the body 25 times more efficiently than air. Soaking major veins cools blood traveling to overheated organs. Ready? I guess we're gonna follow the creek. Yeah, let's just stick to the path of least resistance. That's a good place for snakes to be hanging out. This creek is of the utmost importance because it's going to lead, hopefully, to a bigger body of water, a place where we're going to find signs of civilization. This is not a total piece of cake, but it's better than walking through that wall. Yeah, I agree. Look at that. You think they're ripe? I don't know. They look pretty green from here, man. When we see a tree that's got some fruit on it, looks like a fig. There's around 100 species of figs in Thailand alone. Figs are serious go food, high carbohydrates. They're a very nutritious piece of food that doesn't run very fast. These aren't ripe at all. Still got milk coming out of it, heavy duty, look at that. Yeah. Unripened figs seep latex, a milky sap that can be benign to some people, but to others, the toxin can eat away at the throat and stomach. Well, I'm full, how about you? That's right. Hey, man, look at that. Wow. Man, that's heavy duty, huh? Yeah, it is. All of a sudden, the creek opens to this huge cavernous mouth with one tooth hanging from there, like some wacko jack-o'-lantern. There's definitely fruit bass living in here, brother. There's a big acid hole right here. What's well, where the fruit acids in their ass is eating a hole in there. Yeah, it does look like the bat cave. At this point, this water goes into this cave. Continuing through this cave is the only way to continue following the water. The thing with caves is, you know, this one has water going in, but it might not have water going out. There might not be an out. This is like a huge whale, and my name's not Jonah. So I, I don't know if we want to tackle this or not. You know, in my country, there's lots of caverns, and this thing could just keep going and going. This could surface in Istanbul. It looks pretty impenetrable around this thing. There's a sheer wall of jungle on one side and a sheer wall of rock on the other side. Well, yeah, I've never liked shortcuts. Sometimes it's a shortcut that kills you. 
Coming up. I think it's worth checking it out. Why is that? As one is forced to give in to his partner's plan. How much further do you think it is? Hey, we got a problem here, brother. Whoa. It only leads them closer to the jungle's wildlife. Hey, look at the snake, man. This specimen could probably kill 20 people. And when Dave Canterbury gets attacked... Leeches, Cody. He bites back. You're eating your leeches? Dude, you okay? You're bleeding out of your mouth. Survival code dictates that when lost in an unfamiliar environment, follow a river until it leads to civilization. Unless that river disappears into one of the thousands of deep, dark caves in the Thai jungle. So what do you think, man? I don't know. This thing could just keep going and going. This could surface in Istanbul. I mean, I think it's worth walking in there and checking it out. Why is that? I mean, it looks pretty impenetrable around this thing. Well, yeah. I mean, 200 yards around that corner could be the light at the end of the tunnel. It's either that or this. Yeah. We're going to have to investigate and decide whether this cave goes through this, you know, limestone. The drawback is that we don't have a man-made light source. Well, why don't, you know, if I improvise a way to make fire, you improvise some torches or whatever. I think I can make some torches. I'm going to investigate this thing with one torch, and I'm going to have an extra one with me. And when that torch burns to where I think it's about to go out, I'm going to burn the other torch, and I'm going to head out. That's the plan. If I don't see light by then, we'll make a different plan. Let's make you some light, then. All right, man. You need some sort of, you know, fire source to make a torch. So I'm going to try to work that cell phone battery. If it has a charge with the steel wool, I'll try to pull off my heat source with that. What I'm looking for in the jungle is tinder, and then later on, kindling an actual fuel wood itself. There we go. This is amazing stuff on this fishtail palm. It has a, a really light pore structure, almost like crushed velvet. It has a lot of cellular structure that's open, which means that it's really gonna absorb very small amounts of heat. I just know this stuff is gonna really take an ember well. Several species of bamboo back here. Oh, hey, look at the snake, man. Oh, this is a cobra. Look at this, man. Holy cow. No, you don't, buddy. Here, right in the middle of the jungle, beautiful five foot monocle cobra, one of the most deadly snakes in the world. The venom of a monocle cobra is so toxic, it's been known to kill full grown elephants. This specimen could probably inject enough venom in one bite to kill 20 people. Nobody should just handle a snake like this. The reason I will mess with a venomous snake is I have a lot of experience. I've handled hundreds and hundreds of venomous snakes, including cobras. They have neurotoxic venom. This thing will shut your heart down. And you can hear this thing hissing. When it gets mad, it opens up that hood, and those are ribs that spread out. That's its predatory stance to ward off predators. You're better off not messing with venomous snakes, so I'm gonna let this snake go and move on. Wow. Look at the size of that print. With the big toenail up front, I bet you that's Asian elephant. You know, there's a very large animal out here that we need to be aware of. It's the king of this jungle, as far as I'm concerned. This pretty much confirms my suspicions. We have big piles of poop. This stuff is not that old. Asian elephants are not only the world's second largest land animal, they are highly aggressive when something invades their territory. But what they leave behind can be a valuable resource. Since an elephant is such a poor processor of what it eats, technically there could be nutritional value within the poop, believe it or not. Seeds, nuts, etc. that just go through and out the back end. So it's called second harvest. There's entire indigenous peoples where in scant areas like the desert, they would poop on flat rocks and then come back months later and dig through their own poop for seeds of whatever they were eating. I don't think there's necessarily a need for second harvest here but it was done as a survival tactic for real. So pray that you never have to do it. It's almost like a football. Another use for elephant poop, essentially this is compressed fuel. I could put a coal from a fire in here and it's a way to carry fire. So what that means is potential resources and we can do stuff with this dung. That's an incredibly big butt. If 
like there's some smaller diameter stuff right back here. Maybe to get some torches out of. Cutting that bamboo, I just got drowned by water. And you can see it floating around in that cavity right there. What that tells me is that these cavities are holding water for the dry season so that that plant can live. Then if I get into one of these bigger ones, there's probably a bunch of water. Let's test that theory out. Yeah, hear it? It's full of water. If you're dehydrated and you can find those, it absolutely will save your life. It's plant water. It's going to have chlorophyll in it, but it's absolutely clean. You can drink it all day, every day. Just walk through here with a ready-made container. Collect water till you fill it up. Cork it off, and you got a canteen to go. This tender bundle is made from a little bit of elephant dung, fishtail palm, and a little bit of vine. It's a jungle soup. Next, I'm taking the battery out of the cell phone. You can see there's a little minus there, a little positive there. I'm going to take my steel wool, touch one end to here, and I'm going to touch the other end to there. And if this has any juice, it'll glow and burn down like a glow worm. I don't know if this battery has any juice, though, because the cell phone won't even, it won't work. Steel wool acts as a conductor to carry current from the positive to the negative end of a battery. Here's the moment of truth. The crossed electrical charge heats the steel wool's fine strands to a point of combustion. There. That cell phone battery and the steel wool are essentially our matches, and I want to protect those matches. It's zip tight, the baggie seems to be holding air, and that's what you do, because we might need that again. It's what we in survival land call common sense. Bamboo's like a hardware store in a jungle situation. Here we go. Two main torches. I'm going to try to grab three nodes worth of bamboo, smash that up, defray it out, and make it flimsy so the air can get inside of it, and it increases the surface area. Set that on fire, take that into the cave. Smell smoke. Hey, yeah. So that cell phone battery has juice. Good. So good. it's packed safe. Hey, man, right beyond this area. I mean, there's like a large cobra. You're kidding. No. Wow. So we're gonna really have to watch what we're doing. Cody's in bare feet. So just to plant that seed in his mind gives him that extra awareness. And maybe he'll be just a little more cautious. I brought you a present, brother. Open her up. Well, I'm not gonna drink that creek water, you know that. That's not creek water, brother. That's fresh out of the bamboo. It came in that container. There's a quart of water in a 10-inch piece of bamboo. Man, that's like filtered in some schwanky vegan bar. Good stuff, man. Well, thank you. Hey, no sweat, man. No, now I can sweat. What is this thing, man? That's elephant poop. Looks like a freaking coconut. Where did you get that? where the elephants are pooping. I used some to start that fire. Wow, could you imagine pooping that out? No. It'd be like pooping a basketball. Holy cow. All right, well, I got a couple torches, and now I need to get some tinder inside of it so the torch continues to burn. We really need a recon to see where this cave goes, because if I can see light from around that corner 50 yards away, then we're just going to walk in and walk through. The plan is I'm going to take two torches. When I get to the first one burning out, at that point, I'm going to light the second one, and I'm coming back. Ready to rock and roll, man. One in, one out. That's the plan. Be careful, man. You don't mess around with caves. They're an environment under themselves. It's just the roll of the dice to mess with something like this. My nightmare is that Dave walks in there and he doesn't walk out. Ready to rock and roll, man. Be careful, man. I'm going to investigate this cave, because if I can see light from around that corner 50 yards away, then it's probably a shortcut to the other side of this mountain, other than walking around. No matter the path Dave and Cody take, a survival priority is to prepare for the unexpected and bring the most important resources with them. Since I've already made fire, I want to try to transport it. What I'm doing is just taking some of the jungle vine and just making a container to hold this piece of elephant dung. Dung is compressed fuel, basically. It's like a big fuel tablet. So it should burn and just smolder and smolder. I can stick my entire finger right in there, and that's where I'll put an ember. With a piece of dung like this, it lasts five, six hours. And I guarantee you, a torch is not going to last that long. I see an opening, man. It's light. How far back? 
I mean, it's hard to judge distance in a cave, man. Can you guesstimate? I mean, let's say one of these last 10 minutes. I would say torches like that. We need two torches to get through there. Well, do you think it's worth doing this? I mean, it's, it's the only choice we have, I think. There is light back there. I don't know, man. Got to make a decision here. We got to get her done, or we ain't going to get her done. OK. Anyone who goes into a cave that has flowing water is potentially going to lose their life. Limestone is highly erodible rock, so it can be very sharp. It can be very weak. All right, you got the fire? Yeah. All right, man. And the main reason I'm even contemplating going to this cave is because Dave said he saw a light source. We got four torches. I hope that's enough. Thailand's cave networks can be short and straight, or can be flowing stream beds, deep pools, and sharp drop-offs. Torch squad, cooked. We got to stop and relight. Got it? Yeah. All right, let's go while we got it. What I'm worried about is, you know, if Dave actually saw a light source. So you, how much further do you think it is? I want our second torch, so, you know, it can't be too much further. It's psychologically terrifying to be in potential darkness in a place you've never been in before, and you don't know where that journey is going to end, like miners trapped in a cave. Hey, Cody. What? Look here. Light. See it? Then we got to be over halfway there. I can see the light, man. Well, let's just walk toward it. Let's just go. Hey, we got a problem here, brother. Why? Whoa. See that waterfall? That looks pretty deep, man. One of us got to go down there and find out how deep that is. If it's over our heads, we might have to make a plan B. You can see that it goes down probably six feet. And below that, you know, I can't see with the torch the bottom. We don't know the depth of the water and neither one of us can swim for very long holding torches. I don't think it's worth it. But we don't have time to fart around in here. We got X amount of torchlight. I see light at the end of the tunnel, so I'm going down there and we're moving on. Cody probably wondering if I judged the distance correctly on recon, you know, and he's thinking, oh man, I hope this wasn't a mistake. I hope this wasn't a mistake. Because I would be thinking the same thing. In a survival situation like this, you've got to rely on each other 100% of the time because if you can't trust your life in that person's hands, then you don't want to be there with them. In a partnership situation, your most important resource will be your partner. They can be your greatest ally or your worst enemy. You know, I trust Dave, but the thing I care about is, I mean, is that light doable with the human body through it, or is it light at the top of the cave where it's 40 feet up? You just don't know. Oh, All right. A lot of light out here, man. Holy cow, dude. Almost there. How's that dunk pile doing back there? It got wet. I ditched it. OK. Question is, we sure everything in this backpack's dry? No, we're not sure. You want to check real quick before I put this fire out? Hell yes. Fire is not just for a camp with the Beanie Weenies. It's a resource. What I'm worried about is the steel wool and the battery. It's the way to make fire. But the backpack's wet. And whether stuff in the backpack is wet, I don't know. It looks like there's water in this bag. I probably smashed it up against a rock when I was leaning, pushing in there. It's totally soaked. I don't think the seal was done. That's not the way I sealed the bag. That's, you know, screwed. There are no guarantees in survival. Anyone who tells you different is full of you know what. Yeah, that's It's not cool. In the Thai jungle, Improvised fire starting tools can save your life, but only when they're dry. It's totally soaked. That's not the way I sealed the bag. 
I'm not worried about drying out steel wool, but there's a lot of so-called moving parts in that battery, so that's an unknown. My main priority is, if I've got a burning torch, I'm not letting that torch go out until I know we can start fire again. Come on, man, come on. Situation like this, never, never give up. There we go. It's so easy to screw these things up. That's a totally sealed bag, and there's air leaking right out of it. You can never trust your electronic devices to that. A battery that's been submerged underwater for any length of time is going to be shot. A battery that gets damp a little bit is probably going to work. So I just want to take a little bit of the steel wool, touch the contacts, and if I see sparks, I'm confident that it won't be any harder for Cody to start fire than it was the first time. Oh, yeah. Cody. What? Still good to go. No problem. This thing's still sparking. I'm confident that we're going to have fire. It did make sparks again. It did okay. actually burn steel wool. OK. Let's just leave it out of that plastic bag so it can dry out. So did you scout us out a way to motor out of here? Not really. I mean, it's pretty much self-explanatory. We're just going to keep following the river. All right, dude. I'll follow you. Wow. Water slide. Feels good, doesn't it? That's great to be outside of that cave. The jungle's smiling, everything's electric green, you know, the sun is shining. So it's just good to be out of Gnomeville. You know, we're gonna start thinking about shelter pretty soon, man. Yeah. Now that we've gotten out of the cave and we still have some daylight, we want to think about shelter. I'm not real fussy. You know, I've got a pretty good idea. I can make a hammock out here. I can hang that thing just about anywhere. So you let me know what you think is gonna suit your fancy. Well, I can't sleep in your hammock with you. Oh, <laughs> uh, Cody. Here's what I want to check out over here. Look at that monster. The size of that tree, dude. Yeah, this is definitely home to me, man, one way or another. I think I'm going to try to make something simple, you know, just a little platform. Man, I just as soon get a hammock above the water. That's going to give me the best chance of not having critters in my hammock. You don't want to sleep directly on the ground. Snakes, they're liable to come and find you for heat, not to eat you, just to snuggle up. But as soon as you roll over on him and piss him off, then he bites, and you don't wake up. What I'm looking for is some bigger bamboo. I want to work with efficiency, but I don't want to be jerky and quick about it. I don't want an injury. You know, I'm touching the largest species of grass in the world, bamboo, and I'm going to grow up to three feet a day. This is a lot of work to get this piece, but if it provides several hours of rest at night, it's safer because it's above the jungle floor, and it pays itself off very, very well. Whoa tree. Here's that knife. What I'm doing is I'm making a hammock out of one piece of bamboo and some cordage vine, but the base of the hammock is one piece of bamboo. That one ought to do it. Each at the bottom. Don't care if you can toss it down. Survival's a lazy man's game. First thing I need to do is cut halfway through in front of one node on each end and take that split completely off. So basically, you've created a long boat shape. There we go. Right. You would hardly think by looking at this that this one piece of bamboo is going to be able to support a person like a hammock, but we're going to try it and find out. You have to split that remaining bamboo into several individual slats. If you're low on light, you don't have a whole lot of light left in a day, you got to work a little harder. That comes with risks. It is hot, hot, hot. I gotta slow way down. Too much mental thinking and too much working. Down on my knees, getting lightheaded already. Uh. Dehydration is always a factor, especially in a tropical jungle. In a real situation, calories are king. Defend yourself from dehydration. So I think that less is more. This tree already is a shelter. I'm just pimping out a bed underneath my shelter. It doesn't need to be any more complex than five pieces of bamboo, and then taking these and busting them open to provide a mat. If you spend too many calories being flamboyant with your structure, you're missing the point. Man, oh man, that's a lot of work to get those down. The drawbacks can go either way between the two styles that Cody and I are using for shelter tonight. On one hand, my shelter takes a lot of time and energy to 
produce, so you sweat a lot, you burn a lot of calories, you blow a lot of your hydration. At the same time, the convective breeze that comes off of running water will help the bug stay away from me, and it's also gonna keep it cool. Okay, so right now what I'm doing is I'm testing my weight on this hammock. I wanna make sure it's not gonna break under my weight. This is uh, the bomb. Nice convective breeze. It's definitely a whole lot more comfortable than laying on a flat, hard platform of bamboo, that's for sure. This bed is way comfortable. There's a little bit of give. I grew up sleeping on the floor anyway. Real efficient, no BS. This is nice, dudes. Local Thai peoples have been using fire in the smoke created by it to repel mosquitoes for a very, very long time. Mosquitoes are big time disease carriers, so they can be a very, very big problem. What's up, Smokey Joe? What's happening, brother? <coughs> How'd your hammock turn out? Comfortable, a lot of work, but comfortable. So you're set? I'm pretty much set. <coughs> they have the smoldering fires up underneath your bed, and the smoke's coming up, and you want to breathe that all night long, then you're going to keep the bugs away. So. You want some fire? No, I got I got my hammock straight over the top of the water. The bugs aren't going to hang around running water. They're not drinking it. They're not breeding in it. Okay. All right, brother, I'm right across the creek. OK. What we need to do tomorrow is continue our descent, following the water, maybe some food if we can throw that in along the way. But we want to keep our eyes peeled. There could be some critters we don't want to you know, mess with. We have to be real careful, because we've never been in this jungle. Dual survival's art of self-reliance. Hey, Cody. Yeah. Pretty well-known fact, jungle vines have water in them. This might be worth taking a whack out of just to see. Let's try it then. When it's hot and humid, a simple jungle vine can be a valuable water source. Get a drink of that bad boy. There's a boatload of water in that vine, dude. Just turn it sideways and it'll quit dripping. Some species of water vine can provide up to a quart of water per foot. If you can find those vines, it absolutely will save your life. The evergreen forests of Thailand span an area that's larger than the entire country of Costa Rica. Hiking through this vast wilderness in search of civilization can take days, even weeks, and requires a steady source of calories. So there's a butterfly lizard. I don't know how much closer I could get to him. Well, there's one, there's several of those. So it's an opportunity maybe for some food. So he's gone. I'm gonna go try to make a tool with stuff here in this jungle that might let me get a little bit closer while my body stays back where it should be. What I'm gonna make is just a real quickie blowgun with this piece of bamboo. I'm gonna make sure the inside's totally cleaned out. Then I'll make some darts out of this piece of dry bamboo that I have. The blowgun, it's an indigenous hunting tool slash weapon. So what I'm doing is indicative of what native peoples here in Thailand did here in the jungle. The ultimate would be to tip these with poison. And that's what a lot of native peoples did, but I'm not from Thailand. So I'm just gonna go after blunt force trauma and the old El Shish Kebab. I'm gonna split the end, and then I'll put some fletching material, in this case the fishtail palm, put it within this notch I made. I want enough pressure in this chamber to get that dart coming out hot, but not enough to where it drags and slows it down. So I'm gonna try to hit that little leaf, get as near to it as I can. So you can see the power. I mean, that's a tropical hardwood. Look at that. There's the wet spot. So it went in damn near half an inch. You know, if that goes into that tree that much, then any flesh just doesn't have a hope in our prayer. In a survival situation, if you're gonna find food, you find small meals that you can process, eat, consume, and move. Okay, this is a stingless beehive. What's happened is something's injured this tree, put a hole in this tree, and these bees have habitated it. This is all beeswax right here. 
Stingless bees defend themselves from predators by creating nests with only one small entrance. Nothing's gonna hurt me to put this in my mouth. If I close the end off of it and fill it with bees, then there's a little bit of nutritional value to it too. So I'm gonna squeeze them off and I'm gonna eat it. The way I hunt is I move slow. I'm not a train wreck through a, a china closet. The accuracy of this blowgun is up to yours truly. I wish I had a 22. That would be my blowgun of choice. The last time I made a blowgun was about 17 years ago, so needless to say, I'm a little bit rusty. <laughs> this blowgun, you know, I took it because it's one long piece, but the sacrifice was that. You can see it's not straight. Oh, that one didn't have any power. To try to hit a lizard with a blowgun's hard. It's a very, very small target area. I don't have the practice, and I'm just not hitting them. I definitely need to practice more with this thing. I don't think it's gonna happen. Hey, man, what's that? It's just a blowgun, just a piece of bamboo. Cool, man, that's badass. Not really, it's crooked. I, was, I choked. I had several shots at little lizards, and I missed them all. The fact that he improvised a weapon and tried to hunt with it, I think that's fantastic. It was fun, but it didn't really accomplish much at this point. The fact that he struck out doesn't surprise me. I mean. Cody doesn't hunt with improvised weapons very often. You know, he comes from Arizona, and he's used to smashing rats with rocks. There's an area back here a couple hundred yards. It looks like it really widens out. OK, well, let's check it out. And we really got to keep tabs on that river while we're traversing up in this jungle here. Pretty thick stuff, huh, brother? Man, oh, man. Holy cow, man. Sure, it's nice to get out where there's some visibility. This area is a lot wetter. The vegetation is a little bit shorter. The drawback of following rivers to civilization is that they often lead to drainage areas and the various species of insects and animals that thrive in stagnant environments. It's a big pig waller down here, man. This big mud hole, these pigs have just been rolling in it. And we're gonna have to go around that. That might be knee deep in mud. Waller? Isn't it wallow? I don't know where I come from. It's a waller, buddy. That's hillbilly for swine bathtub. It's awful wet in here, man. Oh, Leeches, Cody. Leeches. Oh, leeches, Cody. Leeches. Freaking leeches are all. Look at, there's one that's dropped off and he's left his mark. Wait a minute. Get off of me. Look at that one between my toes. Gross. I mean, look at that thing. Oh, he's sucking hardcore, man. Cody and I have been cutting through some really thick jungle, very close to a water source, and now we're into some ground leeches. Here in Thailand are land leeches, which I find very foul because there's no escape. With water leeches, stay out of the water. But land leeches, they can be anywhere. When leeches latch onto flesh, their saliva releases chemicals that dilate blood vessels and thin the blood. They can drink up to 10 times their own weight in just one feeding. Look how fat that little is. You know what I say, buddy, you eat me, I'm eating you. You're eating your leeches? Something bites me, I got news for you. I bite back. Dude, you OK? I'm trying to kill them. You're bleeding out of your mouth. You got to chew them things up, because you put that sucker in your mouth, man, he's immediately trying to feel around and attach to something inside there. So you got to chew him up, make sure he's crushed up, good to go. That thing's engorged with my blood. All I'm doing is eating my own protein and getting it back in my body, plus whatever protein's in that leech's body. Look at that. That's sick, dude. That's how much of my blood he had in him. If Dave wants to eat his leeches, you know, more power to him. It doesn't do much for me. I'm not into eating my own meat. Well, I'll tell you what, man. We got that tobacco in this backpack. My uncle used to spit tobacco in the dog's water all the time to kill worms in his guts. But they say that nicotine also kind of repels them leeches. Leeches cause an open wound. Open wounds in the jungle can go septic fairly quickly. So that's our main concern is infection. I'm just going to take some of this and kind of keep it in my hand and smear it on my body where these leeches are getting to me. 
tobacco has a lot of antibacterial properties that help prevent infection, but it will also help repel the leeches by smearing it on exposed areas of my skin. All right, man, are you ready to rock? Yeah, let's get out of leech heaven here. This area sucks, literally. <laughs> Hey, Cody, look here. Man, man, that's one hell of a canyon. We have a fairly large body of water. I really don't know what it is. It seems almost like a lake. It looks fairly placid, but that could be deceiving. I guess the choice now becomes back in the jungle or we get on the water somehow. Yeah. I could probably climb up here and get a higher vantage point. Be careful, that looks sharp, sharp, sharp. If I can climb up the side of that rock face, I can get a higher point of visibility on what's ahead in this canyon. If you feel that you can safely climb something, then sometimes it's worth that expenditure of calories to go up and have a better look. Hey, Cody! What? There's a freaking boat out here! You're kidding. Well, how far is it? It's about a 1,000 yards. Can you swim that far? Let's do it. Whatever you got, get it down in the water. Let's get our asses in the water to swim for okay. it. Dave wants to move now, because we don't want that boat to go away. All I've done is cut one piece of bamboo and chopped it in half. So I'm going to run down, chuck it in the water, and start swimming over to where Dave is. You know, I think it's a lot easier just to jump off this and to climb back down. It's too freaking dangerous and too sharp. I'm looking down, and the water is crystal clear, and I can see vegetation down 20 feet. If you can't see that it's clear and see that you have plenty of depth, you don't do this. You ready? Ready. Once you've made the decision that you're going to try to affect self-rescue, the constant focus has to be on the big picture of where we're going and how fast we get there. If you run out of time, you're in a screw zone immediately. You all right? Yeah, it's just slow. It doesn't matter who gets there. Just go. 